The event was called Howdy Modi. 50,000 people gathered in Houston, Texas to see an event where former President Trump was just the warm-up act. The headliner was Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. To the casual observer, seeing the Prime Minister of the world's largest democracy getting this kind of welcome, being able to bring out 50,000 people in Texas, to the casual observer, this kind of pageantry paints a picture of a beloved democratic figure. But that's just part of the picture. The mythology of who Prime Minister Modi is and what he stands for as a public figure has been carefully and often brutally laundered, and often with the help of the West. Earlier this year, police forcefully detained about a dozen students at a university in New Delhi. The students said they had their internet and power cut off and were prevented from holding gatherings of any kind by police who were in riot gear. Their crime? Trying to hold a screening of a BBC documentary about Prime Minister Modi. A few weeks later, the BBC's own Indian offices in Delhi and Mumbai were raided. Journalists' phones and documents were taken by police, likely intimidating their sources. So what was the world's largest democracy so worried about its citizens seeing? What was in this documentary that made India's government use emergency powers to ban it and get platforms like YouTube and Twitter to take it down for Indian audiences? The documentary detailed Modi's role before he became prime minister, his role as the chief minister of the Indian state of Gujarat where in 2002, the state broke out into widespread violent anti-Muslim riots that left more than a 1,000 people, mostly Muslims, dead. At the time, the UN Human Rights Watch said that the po police under Modi's government were, quote, at best, passive observers, and at worst, they acted in concert with murderous mobs and participated directly in the burning and looting of Muslim shops and homes and the killing and mutilation of Muslims, end quote. In fact, until he became prime minister, the United States would not grant Modi a visa to enter the country because of his role in that incident in 2002. That's the guy that President Trump had his quote-unquote world leader bromance with while in office, the guy who enjoyed those cheering crowds in Houston in 2019. The story Modi does not want the world to see is that he is an actual card-carrying member of a far-right Hindu nationalist party. And he and the more mainstream political party of which he's the leader have been cracking down on the rights of the Muslim minority and on dissent and journalism in general for as long as he's been in power in India. Modi doesn't want you to focus on how raids on journalistic offices have become commonplace in India, or how India leads the world year after year in the number of selective government-sanctioned internet shutdowns that cut off the flow of information in certain regions, particularly in Kashmir, where a Muslim majority is brutally and constantly oppressed. Those shutdowns often coincide with events of ethnic and religious mass violence. Modi doesn't want you to focus on how his government has passed laws that make it harder for Muslims to become citizens, to buy property or get loans, or how his party ginned up a way to disqualify Modi's top political rival from even running against him. There are more than 200 million Muslims in India. It's nearly as many people uh, as there are people who identify as white in the United States. Modi and his party are actively denying that gigantic minority their rights while consolidating power for themselves. That's why U.S. leaders treat Modi the way they do when he comes to the U.S. That's why it matters how we treat him. But, and this is a huge but, there's also a level of pragmatism at play here. Because the U.S. needs India. The world needs India. And India and Modi know that. India has surpassed China as the world's most populous country. It's one of the biggest and most important players on the global stage. It's an economic powerhouse. And while Russia and China are fully authoritarian, India is still ostensibly a democracy, a problematic democracy, but still a democracy. Today, Prime Minister Modi was given a royal welcome in Washington. Right now, as we speak, Modi is the guest of honor at a state dinner with President Biden. This just a few hours after Modi was given the honor of addressing a joint session of Congress even posing for photo ops. And all of this puts President Biden in a very tough spot. While Trump was entirely reckless in office, fawning over Modi as much as possible, Biden will have to set a different tone. He'll have to walk the tightrope, keeping India on our side geopolitically while doing his best to not excuse Modi's democratic and human rights abuses. So how did he do today? 
Joining us now is Bobby Ghosh, Bloomberg opinion columnist covering foreign affairs and the former editor-in-chief of the Hindustan Times. Bobby, good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. I want to start with this. This is a tightrope for Joe Biden. It's just not an easy one. He's got a fight going on with China at the moment. He's got a big fight going on with Russia. You, you just can't be fighting with India, China, and Russia all at the same time. Yeah, that's that's about the size of it. But I would push back a little bit to say just because you can't pick a fight with India doesn't mean you need to go overboard and fawn over the prime minister who has such a questionable record and whose values are at such contrast to Biden's values and to the values that we as Americans think uh, matter to us. It's one thing to do business with India. It's essential for the United States to do business in India for trade reasons, for geopolitical reasons. But that doesn't mean we have to bring the prime minister of India and give him, as you describe it, this royal treatment. That's overkill. And what are we getting in return? Well, there's a lot to be asked about that. We, we've seen with the war in Ukraine that India does not line up with, the, with our democracies and the democracies of the West. When it suits its interests or how it defines its interests, it lines up with the bad guys. It lines up behind Putin against Ukraine. That is India. And that is not a leader of a country who makes those kinds of decisions should not be given the VIP treatment at the White House. So let's uh, talk about this, because earlier this week, Joe Biden called Xi Jinping a dictator. White House didn't seem to like that he does this, but ha this happens every now and then. Joe Biden says what he actually thinks and doesn't really feel like it's being walked back. What's the connection here? Is it, is it the idea that, hey, Modi, you can enjoy these royal welcomes, you can do this stuff, but you need to play on the right side? Is, is, it, a, is it a carrot and a stick kind of thing that's going on here? If there is a stick, I'm not seeing it. Biden has not described Modi as a uh, an autocrat, a wannabe autocrat, which is what he is. Um, there is a lot of carrot. You're, we're seeing this in these images uh, that are going out right now. I'm not seeing a stick. The United States has, or the Biden administration, seems to have taken the view that we have to cozy up to India no matter what. It has not defined what it expects from India in return beyond just the vague idea that, well, they're going to be a bulwark against China. India and China, India and China have very difficult relations. The countries have fought a war. They have uh, serious disputes over territory. That doesn't mean that India is going to line up behind the United States, though. Uh, America has uh, more than 4 million uh, Americans of Indian descent. It's a prosperous diaspora. It's a diaspora that uh, is involved in politics domestically and involved in some cases in politics in India. Is, is, is American domestic politics to play, uh, has any, does it have any part to play in, in the way uh, Modi is being received here? There's a little of that, certainly. Modi has a lot of supporters among wealthy Indians. And let's remind ourselves that the Indian community in the United States, one of the wealthiest diasporas in this country, uh, people who give money to both political parties, both the Republicans and the Democrats. And sure, uh, I'm sure Biden has an eye on that community as he uh, sort of gives uh, Modi this treatment. Modi is popular with a large section of the Indian diaspora here. That's certainly a factor. But the Indian diaspora is not a major uh, factor in American elections, not yet, anyway. Um, and there's got to be, you'd think, um, a point where American values, or the values that Biden himself claims uh, to hold dear, should matter more than who's going to give how much money to his party. Bobby, thank you, as always, for your analysis. We appreciate it. Bobby Ghosh, thank you.